Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. It is so good to be together and to see familiar and new faces. We are glad this can be a place of solace and hope for people near and far. So whoever you are, wherever you are Zooming from, and whatever's in your heart today, we welcome you just the way you are. My name is Laura Horn, and I'm honored to serve as lay worship leader today, along with our tech people, Sean and Julia, working in the background to make this all happen. And our sermon today is offered by Reverend Alex McGee, who serves us as our assistant minister. I invite board member Liberty Powers now to offer her greeting. Good morning, everyone. I'm very grateful for the chance to be on your board of trustees, and I'm very happy to offer my welcome to all of you joining us this morning. I've been attending this church with my husband, Mitchell, and my two children, Hank and Cora, since 2016 when we moved to Charlottesville. What I love most about this church is the effort that so many of you make to sustain this community and to make it truly a unique home in Charlottesville for those of us who are seeking spiritual connection and a place for social action. So thank you all for that and I do appreciate it. I will be staying after the um, service to answer questions if anyone would like to stick around. Thank you, Liberty. We are, we are the, the little, little family. family. I'm Chris. I'm Tori. I'm Nora. I'm Leah. I'm Kieran. We've been coming to this church for about a year and a half and what we love about being a part <clears> of this community <throat> is the people we've met the warm welcome you've given us and how we've learned how we're learning and growing together. We light our chalice this morning, the symbol of the Eucharist. We, we gather, gather this, this hour, hour as people, people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. <laughs> We light this chalice to celebrate Unitarian Universalism. This is the Church of the Open Minds. This is the Church of the Helping Hands. This is the Church of the Loving Hearts. Our congregation's chalice has been lit and will have its own screen throughout the service. If you have a chalice in your home, please light it now. We call ourselves to worship with this meditation on prayer and listening. It's adapted from Listening with the Heart by Gary Kowalowski. Maybe prayer doesn't mean talking to God at all. Maybe it means just listening, turning off what needs to be silent, quieting the mental chatter and distractions. Maybe it means listening to the birds and the insects, the wind in the leaves, the creaking and groaning of the trees, noticing who else is out there, not far, but nearby, sitting so we can hear our own heartbeat, watch the breath, the gentle whoosh of air, the funny noises from our own insides, marveling at this body that we take so much for granted, paying more attention to what we really want from life and less attention to the nagging, scolding voice from the past. Or maybe it's all about listening to each other, actually being present for each other. Perhaps if we just sit quietly will overhear a piece whispering through the centuries that's missing from the clamor of the moment. Maybe prayer means listening to the silences between our words, noticing the negativity of space, the vast, undifferentiated and nameless wonder that underlies it all. Maybe prayer doesn't mean talking, to God at all, but listening with the heart, listening with the heart to the angel choirs all around us. Those who have ears, 
let them hear. the source of all love, you who are the holy ground, you who are the sacred in the silence. Be with each person who is here in this worship service right now. Help them as they feel their joys and sorrows, as they feel doubts and fears, as they feel hope and celebration. Surround them in a blanket of care and comfort for all that is true. And you who are the spirit of love beyond our understanding, be also with those far away, those who are suffering because they are separated from loved ones by illness, or political restrictions. Give safety and solace to those affected by hurricane, fire, climate change. Be with those suffering from racial and economic inequality and be with those who are seeking to figure out helpful ways to respond. Be with each person who is in a position of leadership Help them in their hearts and minds to do what is good for the common good. Help all of us to be freed from greed, freed from ego, freed from misunderstanding, and help turn us toward a spiritual freedom of kindness and joy and inner peace. Blessed be, amen. In a moment, um, will be seeing the sermon that I recorded a few days ago. And after I recorded it, I realized there was one part that might be misunderstood. And so I want you to know that I intend to say that a person may have their own unique journey of listening inwardly, especially in the face of outer pressures. And I intend to say that while others need to respect that individuality, a person doesn't need to go it alone. They can ask for help and receive love and support for their unique journey. And so with that clarification, I now humbly offer this reading, this sermon and benediction. May you find it nourishing. Hi, everybody. This is the sermon that I'm putting together for Sunday, the 11th of October, in collaboration with our worship team, reflecting on the theme of deep listening. And I've been also reflecting on what's going on in the life of the congregation 
and in the life of this country and this world. A source of inspiration that I'd like to share with you is the author Jason Reynolds. Jason Reynolds writes in part for youth, but really for all ages, drawing on his own life experiences, his challenges, and ways that he's overcome challenges. He's currently a mentor to many youth around the country. So I'd like to read to you from something that he created called A Letter to Everyone, or it's actually a poem book called For Everyone by Jason Reynolds. And in part of it, he's describing what it feels like to have a dream. And he says, what I do know is how it feels, how it feels when that spirit thing won't stop raking the metal mug across your rib cage, clanging like a machine gun, fired at a church bell, vibrating everything, irreverent inside. Sounds like a prison revolt that only you can hear and feel. And nasty things are being said about the prison guard, that scared, controlling, oppressive part of you and everyone else. Jason Reynolds goes on to say, if you are anything like me, you hope it never stops. You hope the bubbling never dies down and the yearning to break out and break through never simmers. You hope that the voice that delivers the loudest whispers of what you envision never silences that it never cowers with fear and expectations that other people strap to your life like a backpack full of bricks or books written by experts. Because if it did, if it disappeared, if the voices vanished and you were no longer overtaken by the taunts of your own potential, no longer blinded by a perfect vision of your purpose, no longer engorged with passion, what would happen? Well, I guess, nothing. And to me, there is nothing scarier than nothing. So that was by Jason Reynolds from his book poem called For Everyone. And the reason that I wanted to share that with you is because he is talking about listening to a voice inside and what scares him the most is what would happen if he stopped listening to that voice inside. And that is what our sermon is about today. Now, sometimes the notion of listening to a voice inside brings up the images for some people of stillness perhaps meditation and calm. And so I'll tell you a story which may be true or it may be urban myth or it may be yoga myth. But in this story, a man who's very busy, who has a lot of power, who has a lot of responsibilities and wealth, he feels overwhelmed by his calendar and he decides he must go to a monastery and meditate. And so he writes to the head monks at this monastery and says, I would like to come meditate in your most peaceful room, looking at the mountain where I can see visions of serenity. So they, in their service that monks do, invite him. And he goes to the room and he sits for a week and they bring him food in his room. What does he hear all week? He hears the voices in his head about his schedule and his responsibilities and his fears and his hopes and dreams that he clings to. And at the end of the week, he feels no peace and he goes home back to his life. Well, a year later, he decides he wants to try again to get out of what he feels like is a rat race and he writes to the monastery again, I'd like to come back. I'd like to try meditating. I'd like to try listening for that deep inner serenity and this time, can you give me the room that overlooks the river so I can 
think about the flow of life and how peaceful it is. So the monks, being the service people they are, say, sure, and here's a room, and he sits in the room, and each day they bring him his food, and each day he tries to meditate, and each day the river of thoughts and fears and unfinished dreams and things to do keep on going through his head. At the end of the week, he goes home. A year later, he decides he just has to try again. He's heard about people who can listen to a deep, stall, still, small voice within, and he wants to be like them. So he contacts the monastery again. Please, can I come? Whatever room you have is fine. And the monks, being the service people they are, say, sure, come. So he goes and they give him a room down at the end of a long hallway on the first floor, almost practically in the basement. So he sits in his room and all of a sudden he, he feels a vibration and he, he hears a sound that seems to be all around and perhaps even within and he's heard about this sound of, this sound of Om that that pervades the universe and he sits in contented bliss all morning and at lunchtime there's a knock on the door of his meditation room and a monk comes with his meal and says sir I apologize this was the only room we had and I'm sorry many people don't like it because it is right next to the air conditioning unit for the whole building and that air conditioning unit does hum very loudly. So isn't it true that sometimes we are looking for that still small voice within so much that we might mistake something that it is not? Which raises a useful question to distinguish when we are looking for this still small voice within, that could be interpreted on one hand as a psychological need to listen beneath the, the, um, the taunts that Jason Reynolds was talking about or the prison guards of his own thinking and other people's thinking about his um, dreams and feelings inside. On the other hand, there is a still small voice within that one might say is the voice of the sacred or the holy or the divine. Now it is true that sometimes the divine may work through our feelings, but I think it's important for us to distinguish Repressed feelings or unexpressed or unacknowledged feelings are one part of what we may find when we go deep inside. And the voice of the sacred and the holy is yet another thing. Distinguishing those is a lifelong journey and that's why sometimes people go to counselors or spiritual directors or read spiritual autobiographies to see how other people have experimented with distinguishing the inner voice. Now, listening to the inner voice doesn't only happen in a meditation setting in stillness. Sometimes it happens in the middle of chaos, in the middle of a storm, and sometimes that is when we need it the most. If you consider someone who is in the middle of a, a protest march, they may have a moment when they are encountering police when they are encountering violence and they need to make a judgment call and they can try to listen deep within for guidance of how to react in a way that is moral and in line with their values but about what safety means at that moment. And this leads to another point that I want to make, that one person's deep inner listening is not the same as another person's deep inner listening. It depends on our landscape, our personal history, our spiritual journey. 
So um, the reason that that's important to pay attention to is that our inner listening is in dialogue often with other people's inner and outer listening. So for example, in this congregation, one person may be telling a story of how they've experienced something and someone else may share their story and we just have to trust that each person's inner listening is right for their unique life experience. A way that this can go even deeper is when the inner listening relates to um, things that inhibit our inner voice. So for example, internalized homophobia is an experience that some people have had in which they don't listen to their inner voice about their experience of their sexuality and attractions. And that is their own experience of suppressing or having violence towards their own inner voice. And each person has to navigate that journey on their own. Also, a person in society who has a higher level of power or who in a particular moment is standing more at the center of a power structure, their ability to listen to their inner voice and express it may be more free. A person who's more on the margins in a particular situation or setting, how they listen to their inner voice and how they have the freedom and options to express it will also be according to their position on the margins or in the center. And so if we want to honor and call forth the voices and the wisdom of others, we need to be aware of those power differentials and try to decrease them, to mitigate them. Some people have found, like the man in the meditation story, in the monastery story, that when they went inside seeking a certain type of inner peace, that instead what they found was quite different. So you may go seeking stillness, but find an inner clamor, and that may be a deep truth that you need to hear. You may then offer that clamor compassion, and that's another level of deep inner listening, is the compassion. It may be that you've gone inside seeking guidance with kind of a hunch that there will be a certain outcome, and yet it turns out quite differently than you expect. So one story that I've heard about this is from one of my yoga mentors who regularly for many years went to India to visit his own yoga mentor. And one year when it was time for him to get ready to go and he was meditating to plan the trip and visualize the trip, he kept on coming up blank. And after a number of times of listening for that inner wisdom about planning the trip, he finally understood that although he couldn't understand logically, this year the trip was not meant to happen. And it did turn out that at that time, that was the best decision. So I'm encouraging you to be open to the fact that your inner voice may surprise you and catch you off guard. Also, the inner voice can take so many different forms. In the Hebrew tradition, often the voice is a storm or it is the silence in the middle of the storm. From the Native American tradition, there's a poet named Joy Harjo, and she describes her inner voice this way. She says, a woman cannot survive by her own breath alone. And she goes on to say, I listen to the voices of the night wind women they are inside of me. That's part of her Native American tradition. From the European American tradition, the poet Terry Tempest Williams describes a time when she needed to take space from her family and go spend time in silence. And although she is a poet, at that time, 
in um, southern Utah when she visited the desert and spent time alone in the in the arroyo in the um, in the desert um, streams. She used her hands in the dirt to create clay images, and that was how her inner voice expressed itself. And so my friends, however you find your deep inner voice expressing itself, I encourage you to honor that uniqueness. Now in closing, you may be wondering why this matters. And I would ask you, doesn't it matter that each of our inner voices in their unique beauty can come forth and help to create heaven on earth. Ultimately, isn't that our goal? That this world, our daily struggles, the potential of our loved ones can come to fruition when we listen inwardly, when we listen to our neighbors and to nature, when we listen to how history has taught us and how the future calls us forward. And from that, we make heaven here on earth, meaning a place where there is love and justice and resources for all. And to help put that into a body prayer benediction, I will invite you to come along with me if you want to do the hand motions to listen to the voice within, to listen to the voices of neighbors and nature, to listen to the lessons of history, and to listen to how the future calls us forth. And from that, to make heaven here on earth. Try it one more time with me as a benediction to send us forth from this service with your hands, to listen to the voice deep within, to listen to the voices of neighbors and nature, to listen to the lessons from history, to listen to how the future calls us forward, and from that to create heaven here on earth. Blessed be. Amen. My friends, our benediction has been given. Now let us extinguish our chalices. If you have one at home, extinguish it now. Enjoy the postlude before our social time. Scott, please carry us forward with your piano playing. <laughs>